as we've been looking at some of the things happening in our world, one of the things that seems to be trending is this, uh, this move or this increasing number of people, especially church leadership, whether it be pastors or worship leaders or bloggers or whatever, who are, quote unquote, deconstructing their faith. Have any of you heard about this trend, this thing that's happening, people de deconstructing? Um, uh, this, this particular person used to lead worship and now they're saying they don't believe in God. Or oh, this person uh, is the son of this person. <laughs> and now they're saying they don't believe in, in God or don't believe in Jesus or they're deconstructing their, their Christianity. And, and one of the things when I see that every single time, no matter what uh, has been used to describe this person's history, pastor, worship leader, or whatever kind of Christian influencer, it doesn't matter to me. One of the big questions I have is, did they really meet Jesus? Did, did they really meet Jesus and decide to follow Jesus? Or did they just get in because of someone else's persuasive speech? Did they get in to be a part of something different than what the gospel says this is really all about. So there are people who are uh, deconstructing Christianity as a religion, and I agree, you should absolutely deconstruct Christianity as a religion because it's not one. It's not one. And oftentimes we can say Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship, and then we live it out as a religion. Um, like, let me, let me give you an example. Let me give you an example, right? So one way that you live out Christianity as a religion is first let's define what I mean by religion. It's just the, any idea, any set of beliefs where a person thinks they have to do something to be pleasing to a deity. That they have to earn favor. They have to earn good blessings by good behavior. So if I'm good, then whoever's up there should do good to me. And if I'm bad, then I deserve whatever happens um, in the way of punishment or negative consequences. That, and so see, now when I talk about Christianity, you can see how people live Christianity like that. So there are some people who, um, if you talk to them and say, hey, we haven't, haven't seen you in our gatherings in a while. Like, what's, what's been going on? Oh, man, I've just kind of kind of backslid. I know God doesn't want to talk to me now. That's religion. Yeah. Or even if you do come, right? You know, maybe normally you might come and be up here at front. And you, when, you, when you feel like you're on good terms with God, you're up here at front. Ah! Right? But then you have that week where you're like, you, you got mad at somebody, you cussed somebody out, you whatever. But then, then that Sunday you come, you sit in the back. Because you feel like something has changed between you and God. That's religion. If we talk about the relationship that we have with God as a father through Jesus Christ, then everything that we have in our relationship with God is because we are in Christ. And in Christ, there's no performance. But the very nature of the fact that he had to send Jesus for us is because we could not perform enough to be good enough to earn a particular status where we could receive blessing and, and favor and, and good things from God. We couldn't do that. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so, but... When we put our faith in Christ for salvation, for, for righteousness, then, then in Christ, the Father responds to us from that position in Christ. And even if you slip on believing it, he never does. And so even when your emotions go up and down with your shame and your guilt about your mistakes, that doesn't change the power of the gospel and your position in Christ. And it doesn't change the Father's opinion about you. So whether you feel like you had a really good week and you want to be up front because you feel free and, oh, God should be proud of you, or whether you feel like you've blown it this week, you can still come up in front and be free because God's still proud of you. But when you think that something has changed between you and him, that's religion. And people uh, all across the church, um, they don't know Jesus. And so people can get baptized, 
They can come to the altar. They can get their certificate. They can go through classes. They can do all of these Christian activities and Christian processes. And st- they can lead worship. They can preach. They can lead small groups and still not know Jesus. And then when life hits them, then all of a sudden they want to deconstruct. And my thing is, you didn't have anything, the right thing constructed to begin with. If the right thing was constructed, there is no deconstructing. There is no deconstructing from encountering Jesus, knowing him and him saving. You don't deconstruct salvation. You can deconstruct having been told uh, uh, to be afraid of God because people try to manipulate your behavior to try to get you to do good. You know, God doesn't like ugly. You got to be careful. You don't want lightning to strike you. Like all this kind of stuff. Like this is, people treat God like, as if he's, um, uh, like, like this is Greek mythology. Like, like the gods of Olympus are up there. You've seen those movies maybe back in the day where you have people like, um, uh, you know, like, like the, the Spartans or like Troy or like all these old school and they always talk about the gods, right? Right? Don't be careful. Don't you don't want to anger the gods? Or right? we're going to be sailing on this sea. We don't want to anger Poseidon. So we want to make sure we honor him. Right? And people do the same thing with the true God, as if Christ coming doesn't make a difference. Christ coming does make a difference. And because he makes a difference, you don't deconstruct the difference. The reality is, like the Apostle John says, that those who left out from us prove that they were never really with us to begin with. Because when you got the real thing, you don't look out in the world as, with, with envy. You look out in the world with compassion because they don't have what you have. They're missing what you have. And they're trying to get something that is of value, the same value of of what Christ brings to us. So they're chasing after all these things and they're still in darkness. And so, so one of the things that I believe the church must do in order to help those who are in our communities and in our, uh, our, our circles of, of influence Know who Jesus is and know why we believe that he is the son of God and know why we believe that he is the savior. It is not enough. It is like, like uh, uh, Pastor Sean was saying, it is not enough to just take my word for it. It doesn't matter how good a speaker can speak. It doesn't matter about rhetoric and all this. If, if all my points start with the same letter and if I have some really cool stories that are inspirational, and motivational, the, the, the day is here now where the church cannot thrive or grow on a diet of motivational speeches. The people of God are people of God because of what they believe about God and what they believe about God is revealed in Jesus Christ. So what you believe about Jesus, who you believe he is, is really the most important thing about you. That's it. What you believe about Jesus is the absolute most important thing about you. And so, as a church, we've got to talk more about Jesus than about our relationships. Oh, I see that didn't go over very well at all. (laughs) The person of Jesus will change your marriage. If you if if you encounter Jesus and follow Jesus and the Spirit makes you like Jesus, that will do more than a hundred marriage conferences and a hundred marriage sermon series. Now, I am not opposed to marriage conferences and and sermon series, but what I am saying is that if you do all of that without knowing who Jesus is and growing, then there's nothing different than when the world has their own marriage stuff. Jesus changes everything about us. How we are single or how we are married, how we are without kids or how we are with kids, how we are with, with a job or how we are without a job. He changes everything. about. No matter what you want changed in your life, I'm telling you, the answer is knowing more about who Jesus is and more about who the Father is as is revealed in the person of Jesus. That's it. That's it. And when he makes you more loving, no one has to teach you five steps to forgive. When he makes you more loving, you don't have to ask him to give you patience. 
It's all in the package. It's all, and we have we across the board. We have we're in the church. We're talking about we're talking about all the peripheral things, and we're wondering why people aren't really changed because we're not talking about the central thing. The central thing is who Jesus is, and we have people in church who've been saved for thirty years and still can't tell somebody about Jesus because they don't know him. And it's not about well, I'm afraid that they might. No, no, no. You don't know him. If you, when you cannot explain something simply, you don't know it. If you can't talk about Jesus, you don't know him. And we're not talking about being a, some level of, of, of expertise. If you go to a particular movie and you sit there for two hours and you are just, uh, you know, uh, amazed by this movie, you, no one has to tell you to go tell your friends because you, you have experienced something that you enjoy, so you want other people to, to enjoy the same thing. Right? Cinemark or whoever, they don't have to say when you're leaving, hey, listen, can you, would you mind going telling your friends uh, if you had a good time today? Uh, would you go, mind telling your friends about this? No one has to tell you that. Because of your joy, your joy does it. And you want others to experience your joy because you've got joy. If you don't, then trying to tell someone about somebody who's supposed to give you joy, but you don't have joy, that's going to be awkward. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, there is more to Jesus than what you know right now. There is more to who he is than what you're experiencing right now. And I'm telling you, you cannot depend on messages on Sunday to be the main course for you. You need to dive into the word and read the word and study the word and let Jesus come off the pages of that, of that Bible or your app and, and reveal himself to you. Because when that happens, you don't have to argue with anybody. When that happens, you don't have to be good at debating. When that happens, the Spirit of God will come out of you and will answer any critics that you need to answer in a way that's different than what they might assume. You don't have to debate people. When it's real, you don't have to debate people. Somebody say, well, what happened to the dinosaurs? I don't, I don't care about dinosaurs. <laughs> Why do bad things happen to good people? I don't know. I just know the tomb is empty. That's what, that's what I know. The tomb is empty. I just know I, I once was blind and now I see. That's all. I can tell you about that. You have a lot of questions, really good questions. I got some of those questions myself. I don't have, being a Christian doesn't mean I have answers to all of the questions. Being a Christian means I have all the answers to the questions that matter. All right, so that was my introduction. I want to um, just, I cannot guarantee you that we'll be done before three, but we'll try our best today. We are, I, I, I do believe that God is going to move in this country uh, in, in a powerful way by his spirit, but it won't be because Christians are inviting unbelievers to their church. It'll be because you're telling them about Jesus. They don't care about your church. They see the sign. They're not coming. You can change the time. They're not coming. They're not interested. American evangelism, American evangelism, has been focused on trying to get you to just invite your friends to come here. Like, this is where it's at. This is not where it's at. This is where some things happen, but this is not where it's at. And if you know Jesus, you will be able to talk about him wherever you go. You'll be able to talk about him. You'll be ready to talk about him. You'll be wanting to talk about him. You want the Holy Spirit to use you for a Holy Spirit ambush of some unsuspecting person who just thought they just needed a latte at Starbucks, and the next thing you know, they come, they walk out with new life. Like, like th that's the kind of thing, right? But, but you, you, you can't be in those encounters and go, man, if, they, if I could just get them to come on Sunday at 10. That's not a, no. And man, if I could just, man, if... If pastor was here, he would know what to say. No, no, you're there. God, put, God didn't put the pastor there. God put you there at your job, in your neighborhood, in that line at the bank, in that line. Yeah, he put you there. 
That's, this is part of your story with that person. And what I'm saying to you is even, even as a pastor, even as a pastor, I'm just be honest, for years, as a pastor, it's my job to encourage you to, to share the gospel. As a pastor, I was, I was encouraging you to share the gospel and was not doing it myself. I realized that I was functioning in a role. That's what pastors are supposed to do. But I was functioning in, in a role and not necessarily functioning even out of my own identity as a Christian and as a child of God. It's not just for you, for me as a pastor to tell you to share the gospel, but I need to be ready when, when people come to me. And, 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 and me being ready is not about me having studied what are the frequently asked questions. <laughs> Let me do some study on apologetics so I can be able to just respond. It's not that. It's not that. It, it's, it's having, uh, being aware of who is inside me and what he wants to do. And being able to release that whenever. Like looking forward, not dreading it like, oh God, don't, please don't have me pray for somebody today. Like it's not, I'm not, y'all, y'all been there, right? Oh, Lord, I'm just, I'm busy. I don't have time. I don't have time to do your will right now. Um, I just, I'm just trying to get this ice cream and get home. So, but, but when, but with, with Christ on the inside, like, like for real, something changes about how we, how we live. And so as I begin to think about this, one of the things that shifted for me, and why do I tell more people about Jesus now than I did before, is because I just know him differently. And because that shift happened for me, and, and, and people are coming to me as, as a pastor saying, man, I, I want to talk about Jesus, but I don't know what to say, or I'm afraid, or I'm this, and I'm, I'm like, man, let's just not talk about that. What do you know about him? Because there's a lot of other things that you're not afraid to talk to strangers about. Huh? You ever been in line at a, at a restaurant, and you, somebody's standing there, you can tell it's their first time because they're studying it like it's, a, it's <laughs> the SATs? <sighs> Um, I could do, is it A or B? I don't know. You know, and you're like, look, you should, you should try this one right here. <laughs> right? You, should, you, ever, you ever make a recommendation to a stranger? Yeah. Okay, so you have no problem talking to strangers. <laughs> you have no, listen, you have no problem talking to strangers about something you believe in, even if it's a quesadilla. <laughs> Come on, think about the excuses we give ourselves. When you believe in something, you have no problem talking about it. And so that's what we see in the, in the, in the New Testament. And we see some things that have happened in, in, in the life of these disciples as they were encountering Jesus, as Jesus was revealing himself to them. And we see a change happen in them. And because of that, they gave their lives to share the gospel. And I, when, we, when we read certain stories of the Bible, sometimes because we have a tendency to turn real narratives and real events into metaphors and symbolism, we miss the power of the story. And we miss the revelation of who Jesus is in that story. We're going to read a story about Jesus walking on water. But before we read that story, I want you to take another, a trip to me, with me to the end of the Gospel of John. So in John 6, he talks about Jesus walking on water. And in the Gospel of John, he records seven what he calls signs. They're not just miracles, they are signs. Because it's important to John for people to believe in who Jesus is. And so he doesn't just call these signs, he calls, I mean miracles, he calls them signs. They're pointing to Jesus' divinity. So if we look at John chapter 20... This is what he says, because when, when you're trying to interpret something, a person's intention and motive is critical to understanding why they said what they said. So at the end of his gospel, he says, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that by believing, you may have life in his name. Okay, so John says, I, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of things I saw Jesus do. There's a lot of things, a lot of signs that he did in front of his disciples. And in another passage that says, there aren't enough books in the world to contain all the things that Jesus did. Okay, okay. But John says, let me pick some of them. And the ones I want to pick, just seven, 
The ones I want to pick are the ones that are going to help you believe that he is not normal. That he is not just a teacher. The, the, I'm, I'm picking, but there's a, a ton of stuff he did. I want to pick seven because in these seven, they point like none of the other ones do. They point to this reality. And the whole reason why I'm writing my gospel, the gospel of John, after Matthew, Mark, and Luke have already written theirs, after Matthew, Mark, and Luke have already been circulated among the churches, uh, John is in his old age, so he's seen what they've written. He knows how that has impacted, and, and he says, they left out some stuff. I'm, let, me, let me tell you about some things that will help you believe that this Jesus is the son of God and that he is God. That's why I'm going to tell you the stories that I'm going to tell you. So that's his, that's his motive. That's his intention. So then as we read these stories, we have to understand that this is the frame in which he is painting the picture. I'm telling you this. So that you will believe that he is the Messiah, the Christ, the son of God, who is God, the God who's come in the flesh. That you, I'm telling you these stories so that you will put your faith in Christ. And when you put your faith in Christ, you'll find life. I'm telling you these stories. So you'll stop acting like everything is the way it always has been. I'm telling you, things have changed. Light has come into the world, and the darkness could not extinguish it. Light has come into the world. Jesus Christ, the Word, has come in the flesh, and we beheld his glory, full of grace and truth. I'm telling you, because I want you to believe there's a lot of darkness out there, and I'm telling you the light is here. There's a lot of chaos out there, a lot of deception out there, and I'm telling you the truth is here. I'm telling you these stories so that you may believe. And so John, if John was alive today, he would say, I dare you to try to deconstruct this. So, in John chapter 6, beginning of that chapter, he just fed over 5,000 people with two fish and five loaves of bread. That was one of the signs. And then after that situation, it says that the people saw this sign and they wanted to make him king. That Jesus knew that they wanted to make him king. And so he, he left the disciples, he left the crowd, and he went up into a mountain to be by himself. And this is where we pick up in our story. Verse 16. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. And when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were frightened. Now, many of us have heard this story before, and so when we read this story, we read right past it. Right? This is how, we, this is how we, we, we should read the story. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking... see like like what kind of sea <laughs> they saw him walking on the sea and coming near the boat and they were frightened 
But he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. All right. Typically, when we talk about Jesus walking on water, many times we use the story in the other Gospels that talk about Peter walking on the water. Jesus, if that's you, tell me to come to you on the water. And Jesus says, come. And Peter walks on the water. He sees the wind and everything. He begins to sink. And long story short, they all get back. Into, and, and then we talk about the storms of your life. It's a real story. It's not a metaphor. John was also in the boat. John saw what happened with Peter. In John's gospel, he says, this ain't about Peter. He chose not to even include Peter's involvement. Why? Because I'm writing my story so that you will believe that Jesus is who he is. I don't want you to even be distracted with what happened to Peter and his foolishness. No, this is, I, I want you to be stuck on the fact that he was walking on the water. Like that. Because maybe if I tell you about Peter, then you're going to turn the story into you. And you're going to talk about how in the storms of your life, you can walk on water if you keep your eyes on Jesus. This is not about the storms of your life. This is not about your difficult situations. This is not about you walking on. This is, this is about the fact that Jesus walked on the water. Why would you tell us this, John? Because I want you to know that this cat ain't normal. There is something unique about him. At the very beginning of John's gospel, he begins by saying, in the beginning was the word. Now, why is that unique? Because in Luke's gospel, Luke traces the genealogy of Jesus all the way back to Adam. M Matthew traces the genealogy of Jesus all the way back to Abraham because he's writing to Jews, and so he wants the Jews to know that Jesus is from the lineage of Abraham, which the promised Messiah was. Luke, who is a Gentile, he's a non-Jew. He wants to trace the lineage of Jesus way past Abraham all the way to Adam to show that Jesus came for everybody. And John's looking at that and saying, he's, I see what Matthew did there. I see what Luke did there, but no, no, no. Let me tell you, in the beginning was the word. Like he didn't start in Bethlehem, and he really ain't from Nazareth. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Nothing was made without him making it. Jesus has creator power. Where do we see that, John? He was walking on the water. Weren't you listening? He was walking on the water, and not just, not just walking on, like it, was, it wasn't just a cool, calm like, like lake. No, it was a storm. And he leaves the mountain, and he steps out across the water. He knows how he's going to get across the lake. The lake, the Sea of Galilee, it is seven miles across. It's seven miles across. The disciples were three to four miles. They're right about in the center of it. That means that in them rowing three to four miles out there, for, for them to see Jesus, he had been walking three to four miles, and apparently he still got there walking at the same point that they were rowing. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? The waves were moving around and everything, and some kind of way, Jesus walks on the water, and, and with every step, the surface tension of the water molecules tightens up enough to carry the weight of a man with every single step. Who can do that? The one who was in the beginning, the one who is the word, who created everything, and nothing was created without him creating it. That's, and so he's saying, this is Jesus. And then the crazy thing is that, that when he was coming, right, other gospels say they, saw, they thought he was a ghost. Not because he was glowing, not because he was like, woo-woo, not because he's making any weird sounds, because they were out there on the sea and he was walking away water 
A ghost is something supernatural. It's not normal. That's why they thought he's looking. How in the world did how, how did this y'all listen? How did this happen? We're here in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, and there is a person standing there. There's no sidewalk out here. There's no magician tricks that you can pull. He is standing in the middle of the lake, and he's cruising like, like he he's walking. And he gets into the ship, and the ship gets to land. Immediately. That's another three to four miles. They're three or four miles from, because they're three or four miles in, so they're three or four miles away from the other side. Okay, so, so, so there's space there. The ship is physical. The disciples are physical. They are matter. There is matter and there is space. And with matter going across this space, it would take a normal amount of time. These are the physical elements of the universe, time, space, and matter. And when, G, when he stepped into the boat, he moved matter from this space to the, across this space in the distance in no time. He moved matter across space in no time. Who can uh, control and dominate and manipulate the elements of the physical universe like that? Somebody who is God and God alone. Only he can do that. And I'm telling you, I'm I'm telling you the story so that your faith would not be in a good sermon. Your faith would not be in a persuasive speech to get you to come to the altar, but that you would know that Jesus is not normal, that Jesus is God and the Son of God. And then if he's God and the Son of God, then what on the world? Why was he doing? What was he doing down here? Why would he come down here? Because if he's God and the Son of God, what is he doing in the earth? Well, he tells us, I have been sent. I have been sent to, and I, to, to come out here and to, to buy up the brokenhearted, to heal those who are broken, uh, to give deliverance to the captives, um, to set liberty to those, those who, are, who, who are bound. And I've come to seek and to save those who are lost. So he tells us why he came. But, 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 but if you came down here with, with this mission, then did somebody send you? And he made that clear. The Father sent me to reveal himself to you. Well, why would he do that? Why would a father who is God send his son who is God down here for knuckleheads just like us. Well, because he had a plan at the beginning and y'all jacked it up. And I came down here to fix it and to bring you back together again. To reconcile sinners with a holy God. To take you out of darkness into the light. And so I've come as the light of the world. I've come as the bread of life. I've come as the true vine. I've come as the good shepherd to help you get connected to a father who loves you more than you can imagine. So that's why I came down here. That's why I walked on the water. That's why I multiplied the bread so that you would know in a world full of darkness that there is light. In a world full of depression that there is hope. In a world full of chaos that there is truth. And I'm the only way. And this world will say, well, that's not fair. That's not fair for there to only be one way. Why would there only be one way? That's the wrong question. Why is there only one way? That's, that's the wrong question. The wrong question, the, 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 the right question is, why is there still a way? Why? Why would he just say, I gave you a chance, y'all blew it, you're on your own. Why would, he, why would he just do that? That's not what love does. Even when we broke the, our end of the covenant, he still kept his. And he sent his son to be the savior of the world. He sent his son to be the only true light that is here. He sent his son. As the only way, the only way back to him. And is there one way? Yes. But it's not that there's just one way. The good news is that there is a way. There didn't have to be any ways. And he made a way. And it's Jesus. I'm writing this to you so that you will believe that Jesus is the Messiah and that by believing on him that you will find life 
Let's all stand. This is our message to the world. But realistically, you've got to decide what you believe about Jesus. If somebody just persuaded you in, you can be persuaded out. I don't want any, any one of you to be persuaded out. And sometimes you don't know it until some stuff hits your life. You don't know it until some, some questions begin to roll around in your mind and you go, wait, wait a minute. Do you, not a rhetorical question, do you believe that Jesus is God's son? Do you believe that he is God? If not, you have nothing to talk about. If so, you will never be at a loss of words. Dive into the scriptures on your own. Read. Let him reveal himself to you. Be real to you. That's what you're going to hold on to. Stuff's getting crazy out here. You ain't seen nothing yet. Not from the devil and not from God. Right? We need to hold on to what we believe. But we need to believe what we believe. <laughs> Father, I thank you for this time with your children, our family. Bless them. Let their hearts continue to be open to your word and your truth. The revelation of who Jesus is. You said that if we have these hearts that are open, that you will come and reveal yourself. That you and the Father would make your home in us. And I pray for spiritual encounters and spiritual revelation and spiritual grounding in your reality, in your power, and in your love. Something that's undeniable, unshakable, but real, transformational. Let the reality of the gospel of Jesus rest in the hearts of your people. Let them go deeper in its truths of who Jesus is and how he showed us who you are. I pray that the false ideas they have about who you are as God will be broken, be changed, that they will learn to live as children. Children changed by your love, empowered by your love, led by your love. I pray that your spirit would infuse every aspect of their lives and in all of their relationships. I pray that as you reveal yourself to them, they will reveal you to others. And that it'll be natural, nothing for them to fear. That you will bring up these conversations, you'll bring people You'll highlight people to them, those who are ready to hear. Let them not have anxious anxiety about any arguments or debates. Let them just live from the freedom of knowing you and what you've done and the expertise they have in how good you've been to them. I pray this in your son's name, in the name of Jesus. And all God's... Children said amen. Amen. amen.